The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and started praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all my income. The tax collector stood far off and wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven and was beating his breast, saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For whoever exalts themselves will be humbled, and whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of our Lord. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it can be really easy to take this story about the two guys praying and be like, oh, if we just be humble, then we'll be justified. If we're just really, really humble and just like trust God to take care of us, we'll be fine. But when we reduce the story into that, then um, all this humility and humbling ourselves low enough um, just becomes the same thing as, hey, I'm so great. It's, hey, I'm so bad, which is what makes me so great. So what do we do with it? I love reading texts like this in Lent because it pushes us into a different question. It pushes us beyond, hey, how can we be like the good person in the story, to what does this tell us about who we are and who God is for us? It's not, you know, that this guy was down on himself, that this tax collector was so contrite. It's that God is so merciful. God is so forgiving and full of grace, that this guy gets that. That's the key. It's not that he's so pitiful. It's that God is so loving. And the, tax, the, the Pharisee missed that point. He didn't experience justification because his prayer was just full of bragging about how awesome he is. So... The law doesn't tell you you have to fast twice a week. He's saying, I'm super pious. It's be like, I pray like, you know, I guess maybe the equivalent could be like, I pray 500 times a day. Ridiculous, right? Um, and then this whole bit about I give a tenth of all of my income away. So the actual law in Deuteronomy says that you should tithe uh, all of your produce. So whatever produce you create, tie that, which is understood as 10% of your produce. But this guy's like, all of my income. Um, so he's bragging, like, I'm giving even more to the temple than I have to. <laughs> so he's kind of telling God, hey, you owe me, because I'm being awesome. Well, if we treat our relationship with God as, you owe me? I, th I think we're going to feel empty a lot of the time. There's not a lot of grace in, you owe me. <laughs> but experiencing a God who forgives us moves us into a different place. It becomes a relationship of trust rather than some sort of exchange. Whether we're great or not, whether we pray 500 times a day, five times a year, God still cares for us. So what do we make, then, of religious practices? Is it worth praying, then? Is it worth putting money into the offering plate? Is it worth taking communion or even being baptized? God will just love us the same, right? 
Sure, God would love you the same. But we miss out on a whole experience, experiencing that salvation in our lives now. Prayer isn't about justifying ourselves before God. God justifies us before we matter. But prayer is our chance to experience, even maybe just for a few fleeting moments, and maybe not even every time we pray to really feel it, but it's a way to say, God, your will be done. Because we screw it up. Giving of our resources to the church and to charities and looking outside of ourselves with our money, what comes out of our gardens, all of our income, like the Pharisee, is way for us to trust God with that. To say, we've got enough. And to do some of God's work with it and to trust God to make that multiply. To experience a little bit for ourselves, maybe even, how God's acting towards us. Because all of this love and forgiveness giving us this wonderful world to live in is incredibly generous. So when we can be generous too, we're experiencing that same trust. When we're baptized, a big part of it is God making promises to us. That's why we baptize babies, right? Babies aren't getting up and saying, I want to be baptized, you know. Most kids are baptized before they even talk, <laughs> let alone, you know, make conscious choices, especially like reasoned ones like, yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. It's like, infants don't say that. But God promises to them all the riches of the world and life everlasting, forgiveness, grace, mercy, joy. And in communion, God offers himself to us and all the grace and life that comes with it. Life that doesn't even need to be afraid of dying. I know some people who go to church but don't even take communion because they feel like they're not worthy for it, which is maybe how all of us should feel, but the really amazing thing is is that we get to take it anyway. No matter how worthy or unworthy we are to receive God's grace, it's yours! You get it! And so I think this bit about this Pharisee and this tax collector isn't to tell us that we should, you know, beat our breast and humble ourselves and stare at the ground when we pray, or to tell us that looking up to heaven and celebrating our lives is a bad thing either. I think it's pushing us toward the relationship of trust with God. A God who justifies us on his own, through Christ, just for our sake. Not about how great we are. Because God's way better and way more forgiving. And I think that's way better than trying to have to earn anything. Because I'm liable to screw it up. But it's a gift. You don't earn gifts.